Well, good afternoon, everybody. Hope you had a great uh, lunch or great trip to the falls or whatever you did during your break time. Uh, a couple things that we are we are not calling this a debate. We're calling this an exchange of views. So, uh, those of you that are familiar with debates, you would you would remember that uh, two people would get up and they would they would give an affirmative and there'd be a negative and another affirmative. Then there would be rebuttals and then there'd be cross examinations and all that stuff, and it would go on and on and on and. It would get very interesting. This is going to be two affirmatives. So uh, uh, Mike Miano will go first. Ed will go second. So Ed's not going to come up and try to rebut what, what Mike said. So it's two affirmatives, just so we understand how that's going to work. Um, each person will have 30 minutes to talk about their topic. I won't start a clock until they've finished their pleasantries. Uh, Mike may talk a little bit about his background and some things. Ed asked him to give a testimony, so he may do some of that. But I will not start a clock until he starts on his topic, and then he'll have 30 minutes. And I'll give him a five sign five minutes before it's over so that he knows. And same thing with Ed. Um, we will do written question and answers. I'm sitting right over here at the end by this pole. And so if you write down on your piece of paper and bring it to me, then when both of them have finished, then we'll come up and uh, we'll do the Q&A session. We'll have, have both presenters up here. The way we'll do the question and answers is, you, if you're writing a question, make sure you write that this is to, to Mike or to Ed initially. That's your question to them. That way I know who we're going to address the question to. Then I'll read the question. And the initial responder would have two to three minutes to give their answer. Then the other person would have two minutes to give their answer to that same question. So we could hear both sides of, of the, the answer to whatever that question happened to be. So uh, we'll get going first. And uh, Mike Miano is going to go first. So I'll introduce him quickly and then he'll give his own introduction. But this is Pastor Mike Miano. He's pastor of Blue Point Bible Church in Blue Point, Long Island, New York, and I'm sure you're all familiar with him. And if you're not, you will be soon. So, Pastor Miano, come on down. Well, good afternoon. To start, I just want to say that uh, the testimony that we heard at the beginning of today's conference was beautiful. I, I pray that uh, we all took that to heart, and I appreciated it very much. Thank you for sharing your testimony earlier, brother. And uh, I come from a similar background. I, uh, the way I'll start this is that when, in 2005, I found myself in a New York State Correctional Facility um, due to my gang life. I was a member of a gang, um, lived in that identity, relished that identity. And uh, what I would say is a formless and void life, a life without purpose, a life without any function. Um, and uh, yeah, so God in his graciousness definitely revealed himself to me. And uh, one of the major things that was revealed to me in my sin, in my depravity, was that I'm so easily led to lean upon my own understanding. Whether it's the way I live my life, the things I view about the world, the way I view the world, the way I viewed God. Everything was about my own understanding, and it seems that humanity, we're all too quick to lean upon our own understanding rather than seeking out the knowledge of God. So uh, in that moment, I began to seek wisdom outside of myself. I began to study various different religions and trying to find something to live for, because other than that, I was ready to uh, pretty much end my life, and uh, I was just not content with the way my life was going. And... Uh, in that moment, I was approached by a brother in the faith um, that challenged me in regards to the scriptures, challenged me with the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and uh, by the grace of God, I have the opportunity to stand before you all today, um, being saved in 2005, and gaining what I would call a zeal empowered by knowledge, rather than what we read in Romans 10, where in that first century, the problem was a zeal without knowledge. And uh, unfortunately, many of us most likely lament that within Christianity as well, that uh, it seems that so many people have a zeal for God, but that zeal is not based on knowledge. So that began a journey for me. As I began to look into the historicity of Jesus and into the resurrection of uh, his resurrection and into the historicity of the scriptures and the truth of the scriptures, I, uh, I was led through this amazing place where God has put me in Christ, has uh, given me his grace, given me the knowledge of God. And... Uh, 
so began the journey. And I was a end timer. I believed that we were waiting for the mark of the beast. I was post-trib and I was excited to uh, proclaim that message. I went to the highways and byways and would preach everywhere I went. I would, finally went down to uh, Florida, uh, did correspondence courses through Gordon Conwell Seminary and uh, began to do internships in various different flavors of Christianity, whether it was Assemblies of God or the local Baptist or local Reformed Church, um, began to just serve in any way I could, serve the God that I was learning about, the truth, and to demonstrate the truth of salvation in Christ. And uh, today I stand before you all, pastor of Blue Point Bible Church, through again, uh, God's, His ways amaze me. You know, there's no way to put it in any other way than that, that uh, just the way that God has worked in my life, the as a, uh, Mr. Stevens expressed beautifully earlier that uh, there's, you know, everything happens for a reason. There's, there's, there's so many, the, the truth is, if we look at anything that happens in this world, anything that happens in our lives, we see where God has worked mightily. And uh, I bumped into a preterist in uh, 2010 in Fort Myers, Florida. I met with this pastor, and to make a long story short, Mr. Alan, Pastor Alan Bondar, had us was very gracious to me spent a lot of time answering my questions I was just concerned why he wasn't waiting for the mark of the beast and wasn't ready preparing himself getting ready to move to the mountains I couldn't understand what Christians were doing and uh, by the grace and the knowledge of God I, I was led to come to understand preterism um, through believers like yourselves you know through uh, believers that are willing to take the time to answer questions I pray that each and every one of you are those type of believers that will answer questions prove all things search the scriptures and uh, walk worthy of the call to make known the manifold wisdom of God. So today I am the pastor of Blue Point Bible Church, which happens to be a non-denominational Bible church. Yes, we agree with preterism. However, we are Christians that agree with preterism, and uh, we are non-denominational. And I'm also the director of a ministry called the Power of Preterism Network, which uh, both of those efforts are aimed at making known the manifold wisdom of God. That's what God wants his people to do, to make his truth known. And uh, the one thing I wanted to say as I stand up here is, uh, if you're not a part of a, a local assembly, whether it's a futurist assembly or a preterist assembly, I would urge you to do that. that as Christians, we always need to be involved with community. And uh, my heart, and I believe the heart of God, is to see his people working in communities and involve yourself in your local futurist congregation and maybe challenge them with the truth of God, the truth from scripture, or find some like-minded preterists in your community. There's so many different efforts out there that can link you with other preterists. If you have questions on how that can be done, I'd love to talk with you more uh, after today's presentation. Um, just to get into things, I want to say uh, thank you to Mr. Stevens for the opportunity to be here with you all to uh, present what I understand about the corporate body view of the resurrection of the dead. And I want to thank those teachers that I've had, you know, that Mr. Don Preston, uh, Mr. William Bell, and many of the teachers that have uh, influenced my life and have uh, challenged me in regards to the truth. Wouldn't be able to be here in front of any of you uh, without the information that has come through valuable men and women of God. So uh, those are my thank yous, and with that I will jump right into my presentation. I have a couple of quotes I want to start with to kind of just get us thinking and to help you understand where I'm coming from. The first one would be a quote from Richard Hayes. He says this, the Christian tradition early on lost its connection with the Jewish interpretive matrix in which Paul had lived and moved. Consequently, later, Christian interpreters missed some of Paul's basic concerns. And that's going to be a large majority of our conversation today. Another quote from Brian Lewis, he said, when one's hermeneutic is used without any regard for the historical context, it severely perverts the author's intended meaning. Furthermore, a more crucial point that needs to be made is that when one's hermeneutic is bent on separating the continuity of meaning from its original context in an effort to find a tangible modern relevance, it likewise se severely perverts the author's intended meaning. And then the third one would be a quote from Mr. Tom Holland. He says this, The rediscovering of the corporate thinking of Paul has a number of important consequences for theological study. They are as follows. One, it establishes the essential Jewishness of Paul's thought and the error of interpreting him from a Hellenistic framework. Two, it demonstrates that Paul begins his theology with the community and not with the individual. So when we open up to the book of Corinthians, we have to establish, as Mr. Stevens said this morning, that we have to establish the context. And in establishing the context, there's a couple things that stand out to us. I thought discussing, discussing, discussing the details of why 
1 Corinthians, why there were some denying the resurrection of the dead, is a very important topic. Uh, one thing I'm going to say from the outset of this discussion is we see the Apostle Paul using Old Testament texts to prove the points that he's trying to make all throughout 1 Corinthians 15. To me, that points out the people that we're seeking to see clarity with um, in opposition to the Greek uh, pagans that believed all sorts of things about the immortality of the soul and disembodied spirits. It would seem that the Apostle Paul is making a point regarding the Jewishness of the gospel. And I believe that will become evident as we go through the text today. So let's talk a little bit about the context of 1 Corinthians. We know that this was a scattered church. As we were presented to this morning, uh, Paul and Sosthenes wrote this letter to the Corinthians around AD 57, again, the Apostle Paul's third missionary journey. And when you open up the book of Corinthians, right, you open it right to the first chapter, you see an argument about whether they were baptized by Paul or Apollos. Right, right away, there's these, these, all these issues in the church. And it would seem that in the first century, there were about three different major groups of contention within the church. You had the Gentiles who believed they were superior to the Jews. Even if they came into Christ, they still believed that they had a superiority. They were never under law. They never submitted to the system of the Mosaic economy. You had the Judaizers who, the Judaizers outside of the church as well as the Judaizers inside the church that still wanted to demand a superiority to the Gentiles and were still confused by that superiority. You see this being battled out throughout mo most of the first century. And then you had those that just sought to upset the gospel, the Judaizers outside of the faith. Those were the three major people that were around the church, evident in the church, that were uh, upsetting the gospel in that first century. They were confusing things. You have these Judaizers outside of the church that are obviously trying to do everything they can to say that Jesus was not the Messiah. This is not the fulfillment of the promise that had been longed for through the Law and the Prophets. Then you have the superiority of the Gentiles, who they believe, again, that they've never been under law. They're trying to basically say that the old covenant hope is gone, that there's a new thing happening. And the Jews would have been very adamant that unless the old promises have been fulfilled, unless Jesus Christ is indeed fulfilling the law and the prophets, then nothing new can come about. And that was a major issue. And then, of course, you had the Jews that would confuse the Gentiles, where they would tell them, you know, if, you're, if your people died prior to the coming of the Lord, there's no hope for them. There, there's no substance to the promise. These are the issues we see happening all throughout the first century, as well as being detailed in the letter to the Corinthians. With that said, I want to just bring us right into the letter and start expounding upon some of the details we see in 1 Corinthians. Starting at verse 1. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you. The gospel the Apostle Paul preached to everybody, Jew and Gentile, Romans 1.16, the gospel that he was unashamed of. This is also found in Acts chapter 24 and Acts chapter 26 as the Apostle Paul is testifying before different kings. He makes known that he preaches nothing other than that which was revealed in the Law and the Prophets. This is the gospel that these Corinthians received. This is the gospel that these Corinthians had taken their stand upon. And this is the gospel that they were saved by. The gospel that was revealing the faith and the promise of that which was promised in the Law and the Prophets. If you hold fast to the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. It's very important right there to note that we're talking to the church. This is a, an answer to the church. These are Christians that, that are having issues in regards to um, the gospel that was being preached to them. Apostle Paul continues in verse 3. For I delivered to you of first importance that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And again, these are Old Testament scriptures. The scriptures you would want to go to is Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, where it talks about that being raised on the third day. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, that Christ was crucified for the church, for the, his people. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 19, would be another great text to uh, read about, where you read about the specific, who were the dead. The dead were the dead in Israel. They were the dead. Israel was dying. These are their promises, their scriptures. Continuing in verse 5, the Apostle Paul says, that Christ appeared to Cephas, Peter, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Again, this was the sign of Jonah that Christ promised to that generation, that they would see no other sign but the sign of Jonah, which was Christ dying, going into the belly of the earth for three days, and coming out. That was the promise. That's why Jesus Christ's resurrection happened exactly as it did. 
Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God be with me. Whether it was I or they, so we preached and so you believed. So these are believers that we're talking to. These are people that believe in the resurrection of Jesus. They believe that Jesus appeared to everybody that was listed there. They believe in the scriptures. They believe in the promises that were given to Israel. Now, verse 12. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, again, a fulfillment of the law and the prophets, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? So if Jesus has been raised from the dead, and they believe that, they've taken their stand upon this gospel, as we read in the first three chapters, how are some among them saying that there is no resurrection of the dead? As we've noted, this resurrection of the dead ones. What were they denying? What was the issue here? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. Well, these people believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. they seen him. They just said, and go up a couple of verses, they believe that Jesus died and raised from the dead. they they seen him. they seen that resurrection. The resurrection they're denying is the resurrection from the Hadean realm. They, he's saying, if Christ has been preached for, that he's been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? Those that are in Hades. These people are denying that there's a resurrection of the dead. Those that were in Hades were not being raised. The fulfillment of the law and the prophets, the old covenant dead. That's what we're talking about here. That's what's being argued. Whoever these people are that stand in opposition to the gospel are people that are denying the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. They're denying that Israel's old covenant dead to whom these promises were made were being raised out of that death. But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. Again, remembering, they believe that he had died. They seen him come out of the grave after the three days. The question is is about that Hadean realm. If you're saying that the dead ones that are in Hades are not being raised, that's what's being argued here. That there's some that are saying that the dead ones in Hades had not been raised. If you're saying they had not been raised, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. And your faith is also. Because again, the reason why these people are coming into the hope of Israel, into the law of the promises of the law and the prophets, is because that's the gospel. The gospel is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. The Apostle Paul says that Acts chapter 24 and Acts chapter 26. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is also in vain. Moreover, we are found to be false witnesses of God, because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. Why? Now remember, again, this this logic would seem backwards if he's arguing against the actual resurrection of Jesus. They believe that. They have that. The question is, was he raised from among the dead ones, which was the hope of Israel? That's the hope of Israel, to be raised out of that Hadean realm. Was he raised out of that? Some in the church at this time are denying that. They're denying that reality, that corporate resurrection of those that were in Hades. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith is also in vain. We are found to be false witnesses. We testify that God raised Christ who he did not raise if the dead are not raised. These are the fulfillment of the promises to Israel. Romans chapter 9, the Apostle Paul makes very clear that the promises were given to Israel of the flesh. Romans chapter 15, the Apostle Paul makes very clear that those that were coming into the promises, the Gentiles are coming into the fulfilled promises of Israel. That's the gospel. Galatians chapter 1, that's the gospel. That's that one hope of Israel, Ephesians 4.4. 4. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in this life, we are most men to be pitied. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. For as in Adam all die. Again, a very interesting thing that needs to be pointed out there is, Who are those that are dying in Adam? Israel. It's Israel's story. Israel are those that die in Adam. So in Christ, all will be made alive. The Apostle Paul is making the point there that as Israel has all died in Adam, so in Christ, meaning the nature and the function of this resurrection, will be reversed in Christ. Israel was promised that their just and unjust would be raised up. Daniel chapter 12. But each in his own order. 
Christ the firstfruits, after those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, when he has abolished all rule and authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. And we're going to be talking about that here in a moment when I get to the majority of the text that we are doing this exchange in regards to what death is being detailed here. I would challenge you that what death is being detailed throughout the Law and the Prophets. For he has put all things in subjection under his feet, verse 27. But when he says all things put in subjection, it is evident that he is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, so that God may be all in all. This is covenant talk. I don't know how you can read that and not see covenant. The last enemy to be abolished is death. He's put all things in subjection under his feet. All things in subjection. This is God putting all people in relationship to himself. This is the promise of the Law and the Prophets. Instead of getting into the details of verses 29 through, what is that, 29 through 49, uh, those are secondary issues. Those are questions that are being asked in regards to the resurrection. So I want to kind of bring us past that and bring us into the details that we're going to be, uh, that we're focused on today as we talk about this exchange of the resurrection of the dead, which is verses 50 through 57. And this is where we really begin to see the power of what's being expressed here. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. So what's the flesh and blood being discussed here? Is this talking about the body, the, the person, the flesh and blood person? Well, when you go back to the preaching of John the Baptist, you remember early on the preaching of the kingdom, John the Baptist points out that there's some that are saying they're of the fleshly lineage, the flesh and blood lineage of Abraham. And what does he say to them? Do not suppose that you could call yourselves children of Abraham, flesh and blood. No, because God could raise up children of Abraham out of these stones. Because flesh and blood would not inherit the kingdom of God. That flesh and blood lineage of Abraham were not those that were going to express the kingdom of God. This is not talking about biology of man, flesh and blood. This is talking about the genealogy of the old covenant people, flesh and blood Israel. When we contextualize the setting in which John the Baptist preached, he cited an Old Testament text, Isaiah chapter 40 verse 3, to preach the kingdom of God. John the Baptist raised issue with the flesh and blood Old Covenant Israel to claim their Abrahamic promise. They couldn't claim Abraham as their father. They could not inherit the kingdom of God in that fleshly identity. We also see this in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, where that the flesh and blood descendants would not inherit the kingdom of God. So what we're reading in verse 50 is, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood... Old Covenant Israel will not manifest or inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. Sleeping. We see sleeping used in Scripture to talk about those that were in Christ that passed from death unto life, however, had fallen asleep, meaning they biologically died. They were asleep. They could not die because they were believers in Jesus. So there's some sleeping. We will not all sleep, the Apostle Paul says, but we will all be changed. Again, there's one of our fa favorite uh, preterist proof texts, right? A time text that shows that some will be alive at this coming. We will all be changed. So I mentioned sleeping, the change. What is that change? The Greek word alasso simply means to go from one mind to another. That's what change means, to go from one mind to another. So I'm going to challenge you at the end of my presentation today, ask you, in AD 70, was there anything that happened to the living saints that made them go from one mind to another? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, and we will all be changed. For this perishable must put on imperishable. Again, going back to verse 52, the last trumpet, we all know that's speaking about the coming of Christ, right? That's that... Um, the coming of the Lord, the apontesis, which we read about in 1 Thessalonians 4, that meeting with him when that trumpet is sounded. The dead would be raised imperishable. I would ask you to go through the law and the prophets and find out what is perishable. What is being revealed throughout the scriptures is perishable. And then we will all be changed. The living would be changed. Verse 53, for the perishable must put on imperishable. This was the promise, that the perishable would put on the imperishable, that the people of God would be able to manifest the kingdom of God, that they would become immortal, that they would live the eternal life that they were promised. 
what caused the problem that made the people of God perishable? And you're going to see that here in our text. That's what needed to be removed. What I would argue it wouldn't be the flesh and blood body that's going to be removed to allow you to experience the promises of God. That's not the problem through the Law and the Prophets. The problem through the Law and the Prophets is that they've been given a law that led to death. And you'll see that illustrated here in our text. Verses 54 through 55. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, when that promise is fulfilled, the mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory, which is, a te is right from Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8. What's the death that's being talked about there? Is it a death that we must biologically die and to receive a new individual body and go to heaven? No. The death that's being talked about there is that Israel, in their covenant with God, has now died and they're declared dead in fellowship with God. What's creating that death? That's what needs to be removed. When this perishable will put on imperishable, that's when this promise will be fulfilled. Verse 55, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Hosea chapter 13, verse 14. And here you go, verse 56. The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. That's the problem. It was the law. It was this law that created the old covenant, that old covenant system that brought about death, sin and death. And it needed to be removed in order for this reality. When that was removed, this reality would be fulfilled. The resurrection. The resurrection of the dead. But thanks be to God who gives the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to take a look at Isaiah chapter 25, if you don't mind. And uh, just read through that text. And let's, let's ask ourselves, what death is being talked about here? What death needs to be overcome? Isaiah chapter 25. Let's just start at verse 1. O oh Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name. For you are perfect in faithfulness and you have done marvelous things. Things you planned long ago. You have made the city a heap of rubble, the fortified town a ruin, the foreigner's stronghold, a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong people will honor you. Cities of ruthless nations will revere you. You have been a refuge for the poor, a refuge for the needy in distress, a shelter from the storm, shade from the heat, a breath of for the a breath of the ruthless is like a storm driving against the wall, and like heat of the desert. Your silence. You silence the uproar of the foreigners, as heat is reduced by the shadow of a cloud, so the song of the ruthless is stilled. On this mountain, Lord Almighty, will prepare a feast of rich food for all the people, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all the people, the sheet that covers all the nations. He will swallow up death forever. The Sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all their faces. He will remove the disgrace from his people, from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. Again, that death, Isaiah is writing in a time where Israel was coming under judgment from the Babylonians. They had a fellowship death. They were being removed from their land, the land of promise, the southern tribes. You see, Hosea does the same thing in Hosea chapter 13, verse 14. He's speaking in a time when the Assyrians had come into the land in 722 BC and wreaked destruction and they were taken out of the land. When they were out of the land, they didn't feel as though they were in fellowship with God because they weren't. When you're in the land, you're under the rule of God and you have the peace of God. You're, you're in fellowship with God. The problem throughout Scripture is not detailing that we have flesh and blood bodies and one day we need to shed this physical body to go be with God. The problem throughout Scripture is that the people of God wanted to demonstrate His truth, wanted to show that they had a covenant with God. And if they walked in line with that covenant, they would be blessed. However, they had a law that showed that not only showed, magnified, let's use that as the Scriptures say, that magnified sin magnified the death that they had, made it impossible to walk as the image of God. That's the death that Scripture is revealing as the problem. That death was manifest through law. That's the, the law and the prophets. That's the hope that one day this death, this sin, this law would be removed from us so that we would be able to be the people of God. We'd be able to walk as the image of God. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then I'm going to make my last point here in this text from verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. As the apostles preached the gospel that they knew, that was revealed through the law and the prophets, 
They were inviting the Gentiles to come into those riches. That was the bit, that was the gospel according to Romans chapter 15 verse 8. The gospel was that there was resurrection in Christ, that you can come into the truth of Jesus Christ, that the dead ones of old covenant Israel would take part in this resurrection at the coming of the Lord. They would be received into this body of Christ, the promise. That's the resurrection hope. It's a corporate hope. It's a raising up of the dead ones out of Hades. It's a removing of that law and sin and death, a changing of the living saints that, now I want to make a point here, that in uh, the first century when the saints were gathered in Pella, as they listened to the wisdom of God, right, they fled to the mountains as they were told to, and they're surviving in Pella. When you saw that coming of the Lord occur in AD 70, right, the Romans came into the city and destroyed the city. Do you suppose that the people that were in the mountains had a change of mind? I understand that uh, Mr. Stevens is going to come up and offer the view that they were raptured, and that was the change that they endured. However, I'll challenge that the change that they endured was that they went from one mind to another. They were empowered. They were vindicated that this is true, that Jesus is the Messiah. He told us to flee to the mountains. We're not of these people that are being destroyed and led into captivity. And that death is now destroyed if we're in Christ Jesus, in his corporate body. If we can be found in Christ, our promises are fulfilled. That's what those people in the mountain experienced. That was the change of the living. They were an empowered community. What we should be today is an empowered community of God, vindicated by the fulfilling of the law and the prophets. That's the gospel the Apostle Paul preached. That's the gospel we need to take our stand upon. I pray that I've uh, edified you and challenged you in that, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Pastor Mike Miano. That was fantastic. Um, once again, I mentioned to you that if you have questions, when you have questions, write them on that sheet of paper. Make sure you, you tell me who the question is for initially, whether it's for Pastor Miano or for uh, Ed Stevens. And then we will ask that question to that person first, and they'll get two or three minutes to respond. And then the other person will get uh, two minutes to also respond. Uh, written questions only. And turn them into me over here at this table right there. Do you need much time to set up? I'm all set. Okay. All right. So I'll introduce to you this. Uh, everybody knows Ed Stevens, but uh, just this is our president of the International Predators Association, Ed Stevens, and the host of our conference. Let's welcome him to his exchange. Mike, is this yours? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. It's a great uh, privilege here to interact with Mike. I've been looking forward to this, and I know he has been as well. So I appreciate him explaining his view, uh, because it's not often that I get a chance to interact with someone, someone who actually believes a certain position who explains it to me without lots of defensiveness and etc. I mean, I appreciate your straightforward uh, delivery on that. That was marvelous, very helpful. And I'm sure those of you who are listening can see a very clear contrast between the two views that are being presented here. I shared a little bit with you in this morning's lesson about. Uh, the background of 1 Corinthians and those deniers who were denying a resurrection. So I won't spend uh, much more time dealing with the background and the context there. I want to get right into the text uh, that we are exchanging here, and that's 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 through 57. You might want to open your Bible there. And we will be going over into 2 Corinthians 5, which I believe is a further development and further explanation of, of the text here in 1 Corinthians 15, because it seems like the, uh, the saints in Corinth did not quite understand what this bodily change was all about. And evidently they ask Paul for a further explanation of that. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he then 
backs up and deals with this bodily change idea in more detail. So we'll be looking at that because it's a very closely related uh, context to the same audience about the same subject. And so I think it's uh, worthy of our attention. And we'll be looking at that after we go through the text here in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 through 57. Now I've got 12 pages of notes, but only uh, six pages of time. Uh, so uh, I'm going to have to kind of breeze through some things and, and overlook it. So if my uh, presentation is not quite uh, complete, be sure and ask some questions about it during the Q&A session. I'd be glad to further develop some of those points that I'm not going to be able to have time to develop very well here. Um, let me back up here. Now, I don't know if you, any of you use this method, but whenever I study the Bible, I use several different colors of highlighters. And the colors represent ideas. And so when I color code a text, like all the references to the dead, I'll put as blue. When I'm talking about uh, some eschatological event, uh, like a theophany or a, a coming of Christ, I'll put that in orange and, and so on. So I use different colors. And the advantage of that is that when you're reading the text, these colors begin to... Uh, you, you can see connections between them. You can connect the dots. You can see associations in the color. And if there's a section of text that has a lot of one color, you can tell very easily what Paul is trying to emphasize there in that text. And so that's a very helpful method, and that's what I've done with the, uh, the text here that we're looking at, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 35 through 57. I've color-coded that, um, to help me see what Paul is trying to say, how his flow of thought is developed in this. So um, I'll try to point those out as we go. Now, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50, um, he says, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit in corruption. Now, it is certainly true that the phrase flesh and blood is used of Israel. No doubt about that. There are some texts, and Mike gave us a text that, that shows that that is one of the ways it's used, but it's not the only way. And I don't believe it's the way that this text here is using flesh and blood. Here it's speaking of flesh and blood bodies cannot inherit the heavenly kingdom of God. They cannot have an afterlife. You cannot go into heaven with a flesh and blood body. And there's several other references in our Bible and in the New Testament, especially Apostle Paul and even Jesus, uh, who use flesh and blood in that sense of a humanity, uh, of, of our flesh and bones body, flesh and blood body. Uh, Jesus, when he was raised from the dead, talks about his body as being flesh and bone. So that's the way I'm defining it, or the term, or that's the way the Bible, I believe, defines it in this context. The context helps us understand that that's the definition of flesh and blood that Paul is referring to. And it flows right on through the context, as we've noticed, uh, the Greeks there in Corinth were denying a resurrection because they did not see any place for a flesh and blood body to exist in their afterlife. They didn't want a body, like bodily existence in the afterlife. That was a source of corruption to them, and they wanted to be free of it. They considered the body as a prison or a tomb or a, uh, a, a thwart to them, and an enemy to them, and they wanted to be free of it in the afterlife. They did not want a bodily existence. So I think that's what Paul is referring to here in the context. Flesh and blood is not going to be able to inherit the heavenly kingdom of God. They're not going to have flesh and blood bodies in 
the afterlife. They can't enter into the kingdom of God in heaven with flesh and blood bodies. Nor, he says, does corruption inherit incorruption. Now, back in verse 42, he said, So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. That's the same Greek word as you see in verse 50. It is raised in incorruption, which is the same Greek word as verse 50 has there. So there's a connection. Paul is connecting verse 50 back with 42, which says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. Now what does that tell us? A resurrection was necessary before one could be a part of the new age in Christ, which was evidently still future because right here in the context, in verse 52, he says that that resurrection of the dead was still future. And he also said the same thing in verse 22 and 23 as we noticed this morning. And so this future resurrection is going to be with incorruptible bodies. He says that in verse 52, that the dead will be raised incorruptible. They can't be raised with their flesh and blood bodies. They have to be raised in incorruption, incorruptible. Okay, uh, and so that establishes for those Greek people there who were denying a resurrection, the kind of body they were asking about. In verse 35, they have said, well, with what kind of body do they come? Well, Paul answers that right here. He says, it's not corruptible flesh and blood bodies. It's incorruptible. They're going to be raised incorruptible. Then verse 51, very interesting text. If you've done any um, Greek textual study, you'll know that there's four different variations, at least four. Uh, there may be five. I think uh, somebody mentioned that there was five actual textual variations in this one verse, 51. There's at least four, and uh, the textual commentary by Bruce Metzger indicates that this was a very early change to the text, and that it came about because all those people who were alive in Paul's day had died by the time of the second century. There was none of them still around. And so, since Paul says, we're not all going to sleep before this resurrection occurs. And that resurrection had not occurred yet, at least they didn't think it had. Therefore, this text was wrong. They, they were seeing Apostle Paul as making a, a wrong statement here, so they had to help Paul out of a jam. And they created four different textual variations of this. And I'm not going to spell those out. We don't have time. But the one that you have in your Bible here is the correct one. Uh, the textual scholars have done a very good job of resurrecting it, even though, even though they don't like it. They have to assume that this is the correct way because it's, it's the only way to make sense of this context. Notice what Paul says. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. We're not all going to die before this resurrection event occurs. But we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised, incorruptible, and we will be changed. In verse 51, who is the we? Who is he writing to? Living people or dead people? Living people. Specifically the Christians in Corinth. And he says to them, We, the living people, are not all going to sleep. We're not all going to die before this resurrection occurs. 
But all of us who are alive at that event will be changed. And you can just hear the Corinthians saying, well, the dead are going to be raised here. But what's going to happen to us living folk when this resurrection occurs? The dead are going to be raised incorruptible. They're going to get new bodies. But what about us? We've already got a body on. What's going to happen to us? And that's what he spells out here for us in verses 53 and 54. But look at the we there. In verse 51, it may be a little unclear that he's speaking only about the living, the, those who will be alive at the time of the resurrection. But if there was any doubts about what it means, verse 52 clears it up. Notice the contrast, the clear contrast here in verse 52 between the dead who will be raised and the living who will be changed. And the living had to get the same kind of bodies that the dead got. And the dead got new, incorruptible, immortal, spiritual, heavenly, glorified bodies, just like Christ's glorious body. And so the living were saying, well, they're getting this, but what do we get? And Paul says, you're going to be changed because flesh and blood cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. It has to be changed. And that's what the change is all about. The dead are raised incorruptible, and we, verse 52, we, who is that? That's the living. The dead are raised. The living are changed. Now, I like what Murray Harris says about this on pages 253 through 256 in his book, From Grave to Glory. He says, But if death is a prerequisite for resurrection, as it implies in verse 36 and following, the seed does not come to life, unless it dies. So if death is a prerequisite for resurrection, how will they fare who never die, who are still alive at the time of the resurrection? Paul recognized this important exception to his rule and addresses this issue after he has answered the twofold question he posed in verse 35. Listen, I'm telling you a mystery. Not all of us are to fall asleep, but we shall all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet blast, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised immortal, and we shall be changed. In verse 52, the dead and we are clearly contrasted. The we, therefore, referring to Christians who are destined to be alive at the second advent, this then indicates that the we in the parallel passage in verse 51 also refers to those who will be alive at the parousia. So he, he's saying here that verse 52 clears up the mystery about who the we is in verse 51. There's no doubt about it in verse 52 because there's a clear contrast between the dead being raised and the living being changed. And so the change only applies to the living. And it was so that the living would get the same kind of body that the dead were getting when they were raised. That's a very important point because there are people who say that the living got something different than the dead did at the resurrection. The living just got a change of mind or a change of status, whereas the dead actually got new bodies and went to heaven. But that's not what Paul is teaching here. They both get the same kind of new body. In verse 52, the dead and we the living are clearly contrasted. The we, therefore, referring to Christians who are destined to be alive at the second advent. 
This then indicates that the we in the parallel passage in verse 51 also refers to those alive at the time of the parousia. Now, he gives us a paraphrase of verse 51 and 52. Notice he says, this is Murray Harris, uh, to paraphrase Paul's explanation in verse 51, he says, I am telling you about an aspect of God's purpose that has been communicated to me by special revelation. I expect that we who are now alive shall not all fall asleep. But the mystery revealed to me is that all of us who survive until the parousia will be changed. On this view, the essence of the mystery is that those Christians who do not by a pre-parousia death qualify for the resurrection, nevertheless will all, without exception, undergo the required transformation or change at the parousia. Verse 52 clearly contrasts those two groups. The dead will be raised, and we who remain until the coming of the Lord will be changed. Notice the future tense there. The dead will be future tensed, raised, and we the living will be future tense changed. They were not in that change at the present time. The resurrection was not a ongoing process at the time. Both the resurrection and the change are future intense here in verse 52. And this is not the only time. As we notice, verse 22 and 23 says the same thing about that future tense of this resurrection. Paul reserves the experience of resurrection for the dead and reserves the bodily change for the living. The dead are not changed. And you'll see that over in Philippians 3.21, uh, kind of a parallel passage, very connected to this. If you want to flip over to Philippians 3.21, notice he's talking about those who are alive on earth at the time of the second coming. He says in verse 20, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body into conformity with His glorious body by the exertion of the power He has even to subject Himself subject all things to himself. Now notice he's speaking to living people, living, breathing people there, and he's talking about what would happen to them at the parousia. They would be changed. Their lowly physical bodies would be changed into conformity with his glorious body. The same thing that he's talking about here in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 51 and 52. Now, 53 and 54, verses 53 and 54, I believe, just continue on talking about this bodily change. I don't think he switches gears here uh, because he's still explaining what this bodily change is going to be. And the reason I say that is because of the language that he uses here in verse 53. Notice he says, for this corruptible. Notice he uses the demonstrative personal pronoun this, and all the commentaries note that when Paul especially uses that demonstrative pronoun this, he's referring to something very definite. There's no, no ambiguity here. It's a very specific reference to something. And they, they say that, that something that he is referring to or pointing to with the, this finger is this body that we the living have. Notice he says, this corruptible must put on incorruption. Now, what happened at the bodily change when those saints' mortal bodies were changed from mortal to immortal? What happened? This corruptible must put on incorruption. And you could just see those Greek people there in Corinth who didn't understand this kind of 
resurrection and bodily change, you can just see their eyes rolling around. Oh, now I get it. That's how we are raised, and that's the kind of body we get. We get a new kind of body. It's not this old corruptible body. It's not this body. This body has to be changed. Now, why can't that be referring to the dead as well? See if you can answer that from the text. Why is this not referring to dead people? Why is it only referring to living people? Because it says this, corruptible. The dead were disembodied. The dead didn't have bodies. They didn't have this corruptible body. They didn't have a body to be changed. They just needed to be raised out of Hades and put on their new immortal bodies that God would give them. Verse 38, he says, God gives it a body just as he wished, and to each of the seeds a body of its own. So they didn't have a body. When they, were, when they died, they were disembodied. When they were raised out of Hades, they got their new bodies. So when he says, this corruptible, in verse 53, must put on incorruption, and this mortal, this mortal body that we're wearing right now, we the living ones, this mortal must put on immortality. Now, everybody catch that point? You see what we're saying? Verse 53 and 54 are not referring to the dead. The dead are not going to participate in this bodily change because they don't have a body to be changed. Only the living folks who are still alive at the parousia would get this bodily change. And it would be a change of their mortal bodies into immortal bodies. And then verse 54, he says, But when this corruptible will have put on incorruption, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Now, think about this. Death personified is, is what the commentaries talk about here. Notice death is capitalized in a lot of your translations. Death is, is the death angel, the destroying angel of the Old Testament. Remember, remember the destroying angel that passed over Egypt and killed all the firstborn who, who were in the houses of, that did not have the blood on the door? That destroying angel, that was the death angel. And uh, he was the one who had the power from God to kill and to send the disembodied souls into Sheol or Hades. And it's that death who had that power to disembody and imprison us in Hades that Paul is taunting here in verses 54, 55, and 56. Death personified, or death, the death angel, who had control over sending them to uh, Hades. And he also references Hades as well. In some translations, uh, they prefer the, uh, the Septuagint reading there. And so you'll see death and Hades both. And other translations, like the New American Standard, uses death in both places. But it's death personified, referring to the angel of death. And Paul is taunting him and saying, now, think about this. If the dead are raised out of Hades, is that plundering the prisoners that death and Hades had? Is it stripping death and Hades of their power to separate and imprison the people? Now, what about the living? If the living had their bodies changed from mortal to to immortal without having to die. How does that work in death and Hades? So, you can see what's happening here. Paul is saying, 
the dead are going to be raised imperishable. The living are going to be changed without experiencing physical death. Now that ought to blow your socks off when you really understand what Paul is talking about here in this. It floored me when I understood this. Reading all the commentaries and stuff, when I understood what Paul was talking about in this bodily change, I was just blown away. Profound beyond words. So he says, When this corruptible that we the living have will have put on incorruption. Notice the future tense language there. We'll have put that on. It's not being put on right now. It will be put on when the dead are raised out of Hades. When that happens, he says, then will come about the saying that, that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. What a victory for God and for Christ and for the resurrection when the living did not even have to go through physical death in order to have their immortality and go to heaven to be with Christ. Now, um, I'm not going to deal with the rest of that. Uh, I want to skip over to 2 Corinthians 5 now where Paul follows up on that and gives them more information about that bodily change. And notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, he says, We have this treasure in earthen vessels. What's he talking about there? We have a treasure given to us in these earthen vessels that they're wearing. It's this physical body. This is not talking about a, uh, a fleshly Israel corporate body. It's talking about their individual bodies, their earthen vessels that they were wearing. We have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not despairing, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always caring about in the body the dying of Jesus. Now what body is he talking about there in verse 10? It's not the collective body. It's his own body. Those uh, apostles and their, their uh, helpers, like Apostle Paul had, uh, were dying daily in that persecution. Their earthen vessels were uh, being persecuted almost to the death. He says, we carry about in our bodies daily the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Verse 11, For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death works in us, but life in you. Notice the contrast between the apostolic band, Paul and his co-workers, versus those in Corinth. So death works in us because of our persecution for the sake of preaching the gospel. But life works in you. You get the benefit of it. Uh, you're not subject to this persecution as much as we are. He says, verse 13, But having the same spirit of faith, according to what I, is written, I believe, therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore we also speak, knowing, now verse 14, very critical to the context here of 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 4, 14, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also and will present us with you. When? At the parousia, obviously. So those who die during the transition period will be raised and presented together with the living. Now how in the world are the living going to get to be with the resurrected dead in the unseen realm? What does that imply? They're going to have to be changed. And that's what he talks about on down here in verse or chapter 5, verse 1. Notice he says, chapter 5, verse 1, For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a body from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. 
verses 2 through 4, then he develops that idea for the living. Verse 1 is talking about the dead. They'll have a new body. It's reserved in heaven for them. Verses 2 through 4 then talk about that change of the living. Paul says that they put on over. They put this new body on over the top of their present body without having to take the old body off in death. Okay, thank you very much. That was fantastic, and we're going to have a 15-minute break now so we can have coffee and restrooms and book table uh, questions. Bring them over here, to Just plop them on my computer right there. Uh, make sure you let me know who the initial question is to, and remember they'll both get an opportunity to answer. Uh, I thought that was great. Let's give both speakers another quick round of applause.